Welcome once again to another episode of SFF 180 Classics, where this time I'll be discussing the 50-year saga of Little Fuzzy. Hey everybody, welcome back and thank you for joining me once again. Thomas here. As always, you know, the other day I was watching some BookTube, uh, which is a thing I do on occasion when I should be reading or working or stepping outside my house to make sure the sun is still there. This is bad, right? And I noticed that a couple of tubers like Sarah over at Books and Junk and Sam at Novels and Nonsense uh, had recently read John Scalzi's 2011 novel, Fuzzy Nation. In addition to being one of my very favorite books of that year, Fuzzy Nation also marked the revival of one of SF's most beloved and venerable series. And it occurred to me that many fans, especially newer and younger readers, might not know the full saga behind the saga. First, let me recap Scalzi's Fuzzy Nation. It's the story of a brash, young, cocky, very John Scalzi prospector by the name of Jack Holloway, who's living and working on a distant colony world called Zarathustra. The planet is under charter by the monolithic Zaracorp, which hires out guys like Holloways to work as independent contractors mining sunstones, a precious natural resource unique to that world. As the book opens, Holloway has rather carelessly discovered what may be the very largest sunstone seam yet, and it's big enough to earn Zaracorp potentially trillions on the open market, as well as enable Jack to retire a billionaire. But this discovery coincides with another, as Holloway soon discovers these tiny furry little hominid creatures that his ex-girlfriend, a biologist, begins to suspect may not only be sapient, but close to humans in intelligence. And if this is true, the presence of intelligent indigenous life on Zarathustra could spell the end of Zaracorp's mining charter, and unimaginable sums of money could vanish in an instant. While Holloway and his friends try to find a way to settle the question of the Fuzzy's intelligence so that it doesn't necessarily collide head-on with Zaracorp's interests, which, to be honest, are Jack's own, Zaracorp, naturally, is perfectly willing to play whatever dirty pool is necessary to protect their financial windfall. Scalzi's novel is one of the very best he's ever written in a career already noted for piling success on top of success. The book contains all of Scalzi's hallmarks. Comedy, pathos, suspense, airtight plot construction, bacon. But it's also an example of the kind of storytelling that's fairly common in movies, but pretty rare in literature. It's a remake. And before it came along, the Fuzzy Saga had spanned five novels from three different writers. The Fuzzies were the brainchild of H. Beam Piper, a Pennsylvania writer who was a rising star in the pulps from the post-war years up into the early 1960s. He's known for wildly influential space operas as well as SF stories that examine culture and history. But his most beloved creation was Little Fuzzy, a novel that earned a Hugo nomination in 1962. It lost to The Man in the High Castle by Philip K. Dick. Piper's own story came to a sad end, however. Late in 1964, Despondent over the collapse of his marriage, plus financial hardships, and believing, falsely as it turned out, that his writing career was floundering, he took his own life. It's a lot of fun to read Fuzzy Nation and Little Fuzzy back to back to see where they overlap and where they differ. Now, to be honest, I think readers today will find Scalzi's take on the material a lot more accessible, a lot more entertaining and relatable, which is to be expected when you're holding up a 50-year-old novel to a contemporary one. Piper's original has its dated elements, of course, but it also holds up really admirably in a lot of ways. Both books feature Jack Holloway as the protagonist, although Piper's version of Holloway is a, he's a much more grizzled, you know, older guy. He's patterned after, you know, the great explorers of, of the wilderness, you know, in the, in the pioneer days, you might say. Uh, these kinds of guys who were really, really admired by Piper, who was a big history buff. Both books deal with Holloway's discovery of the Fuzzies and how the question of their sapience ultimately hinges upon a trial that comes about when some villainous douchebag uh, callously kills one of the little creatures. Establishing that the Fuzzies are sapient is what will be required if the killer is to be convicted of murder. But Scalzi manages to stay true to the spirit of Piper's original by sticking to these plot points while structuring a story around them that is his very own. Which is how you do a remake right. Science fiction doesn't have very many courtroom drama stories, but each in their own way, Little Fuzzy and Fuzzy Nation, manage to be very rousing and exciting and suspenseful ones. 
Piper's sequel, Fuzzy Sapiens, originally titled The Other Human Race, expands upon the ideas in the original, even if it's not quite as well put together. It has some really slow and talky passages, and once again, all that dated content. I mean, you can really tell. These were books that were written in the real-life Mad Men era. But for fans of the original, it offers some really interesting new plot complications. It turns out that the Fuzzies are sapient, no surprise there, but that their intelligence is limited to that of a human being of around 12 or so. They also have a much lower birth rate than they should, and this indicates a serious problem uh, that the scientists on Zarathustra are gonna need to solve. The human colonists living on Zarathustra take to legally adopting the Fuzzies as their own children. What's interesting is that there aren't any human children among the colonists, and I think that's an interesting plot point Piper could have explored, but he didn't. And we see that for Piper, the Fuzzies don't necessarily represent childish innocence so much as they just don't possess a human's ability to fall victim to moral corruption. That's probably a, a bit of an idealistic point of view uh, on Piper's part, but uh, believe it or not, uh, there once was a time when science fiction wasn't too cool and hipster to imagine this sort of optimistic future. After Piper's death, the fuzzy books just never went out of print, and here is where the tale gets interesting. Starting in the 80s, two estate-approved sequels came out, and then something very unusual happened that caused the saga to fork, giving fans of the Fuzzyverse uh, the opportunity to follow one of two story threads, depending, I suppose, upon their own preferred canon. The third book, Fuzzy Bones, was written by a guy named William Tuning, who only wrote one other book in his lifetime before dying very young at the age of 46, no idea why. Uh, Fuzzy Bones is an imperfect, uneven, but for the most part, extremely admirable continuation of the series. Tuning treats Piper's original stories with pure reverence, but his book concentrates more on the problems that the newly independent colony of Zarathustra is having. Uh, as with most gold rushes, loads of people are just flocking to the planet hoping to make their fortunes, only to find that uh, reality is uh, a lot more disappointing, and now the human colony there is rife with homelessness and crime. Meanwhile, Jack Holloway and his friends are learning more about the fuzzies, and they're finding out that their diet absolutely requires trace amounts of titanium, and the lack of it is what is causing their birth rate to drop so drastically. But Zarathustra has no naturally occurring titanium, so how could the fuzzies have evolved a dietary need for it? How indeed. Fuzzy Bone starts strongly, drags a whole lot in its midsection, but then it picks up considerably for a rousing climax. Not a classic in its own right, it still dutifully honors the classic it follows up. The fourth novel was written by Ardath Mehar, an adorably grandmotherly Texas writer of fantasy whom I remember meeting at uh, local conventions here in Texas when I was a teenager. Golden Dream, a fuzzy odyssey, has, in addition to one of Michael Whelan's most famous wraparound cover paintings, both the most satisfying and least satisfying story of all the fuzzy books. Its first half is perfectly brilliant, taking everything to the next level by setting its action just before the action of the original Little Fuzzy and making the fuzzies the viewpoint characters. Mayhar builds upon William Tuning's ideas about the creature's origins and gives us opening scenes, very strong opening scenes, of full-on anthropological SF, as we see the struggle of the primitive fuzzy tribes who don't understand what's afflicting them, what's making them sick, what's, what's keeping the babies from being born, and who eventually realize that they have to leave the valley that they have lived in for generations for unknown territories, where hopefully they'll be able to find the food that will sustain them. Mayhar describes the fuzzies' tribal mythology, their social structures, and for the first time offers the series some of the fuzzy language. And the first half of the book offers some genuinely harrowing scenes of survival, uh, as the poor little hapless creatures set off into the wilderness, uh, sometimes being set upon by ravenous beasts, and with no real clear idea of where they're going. It's all in sharp contrast to Piper, frankly, who, uh, to be honest, could get a little bit more than cloyingly cute in his treatment of the fuzzies. Sadly, the second half of Golden Dream amounts to little more than a scene-for-scene -scene retelling of Little Fuzzy, except from the viewpoint of the Fuzzies. So while those opening chapters are fantastic, and the way Mayhar segues their action into the opening scenes of Little Fuzzy is well handled and, and really inspired, ultimately the book just fails to move the saga forward. Soon after Golden Dream came out, the SF world was rocked by the actual discovery of the manuscript of the long-rumored but thought-to-be-lost third Fuzzy novel, 
by H. Beam Piper, which turned up in one of those ridiculously improbable look what we found in a trunk in the attic scenarios. You know, like uh, this new Harper Lee novel that everybody was raving about a few weeks ago. Fuzzies and Other People was finally released in 1984, 20 years after its author's death. And while it isn't a great book, it offers some moments of excitement, and you can see that if Piper had worked with some strong editorial guidance in the writing process, it could have been refined into a really, really strong book indeed. Mostly it can be described this way. When the Fuzzies take center stage, there's some thrilling adventure here, especially in a subplot about a whole different tribe of the creatures who have not yet encountered humans, despite everything that's gone on before. But when the humans are the focus, it's a much stodgier, talkier, highly dated affair. I mean, you talk about the Mad Men era, I, I don't think I've ever seen so much cocktail drinking in a science fiction novel in my life. It's, it's like cocktail hour in the 1960s was uh, some kind of sacred ritual required by law or something. So Fuzzies and Other People is mainly a book for series completists. Terrific in its best scenes, but with not quite enough of those to make it consistently strong. It took John Scalzi in the 21st century to shine a light on this classic and highly influential work in SF's history, uh, whose themes of the exploitation of native peoples in the name of greed have uh, been <clears throat> revisited numerous times since then. H. Beam Piper left us too early, and it's a true shame that he never lived to see just how beloved his little fuzzies became to the world of science fiction. These have all been capsule reviews, but if you want to read my full-length, in-depth written reviews of all six official fuzzy novels, I'll leave the links below. Also, a lot of H. Bean Piper's work, including Little Fuzzy, is now in the public domain, and ebook versions can be downloaded free from sites like the Gutenberg Project. That is all I have time for on this episode of SFF 180 Classics. I appreciate all of you joining me. Remember, most important thing, as always, these are reviews. You will not always agree with me, but if you enjoyed watching, please leave a like, share this video far and wide with your SFF reading friends on social media, and above all, please subscribe. That's how this channel grows. And until I see all of you next time, fuzzy reading.